Welcome back to Recap. Are you ready for a... As usual, I'll be doing the writing and the talking while my pal Johnny D does the editing and the video. First of all, let's start with airplay updates. For those of you coming into this late in the game, Airplay is an event that an SPJ board member is putting on for both people involved in the Consumer Vault and its opposition to debate each other in a public forum. The name of that board member is Koretsky. In these two weeks, there were two updates. The first article confirmed my suspicion from the last video, the suspicion that Koretsky was poking us to see how we'd react. It's what I describe as a gonzo piece about how Koretsky experienced the whole thing when interacting with both sides. He states that he's trying hard to be equally hated by both sides, but he's having a bit of a challenge doing this because the people involved in the Consumer Vault are a bit friendlier than he expected. He gave examples of some of the suspicion and anger that he saw from people using the Gamergate hashtag, but also gave examples of some of the encouragement that he saw as well, and said that this was normal for a passionate group of people. He also described his encounters with those opposed to discussing the Gamergate scandals, and as expected, they are opposed to discussing it. Jay Allen, also known as a man in black, reiterated to Koretsky how he thinks that 100% of Gamergaters are a hate mob, excusing and enabling hateful people in order to use them as leverage. Kretzky stated that this did not comport with his own experiences. In the end of the article, he describes how he tried to contact Catherine Cross, and how he received no reply except for this perfect example of guilt by association call-out culture that she tweeted out afterwards. She's stretching guilt by association so far that I can smell the bullshit from here. She's accusing Koretsky of politically benefiting from doxing due to his association with Gamergate, and Gamergate's supposed association with Chuck Johnson. I see zero evidence of that Chuck Johnson connection, other than an article in the Daily Banner that just happened to mention him and Gamergate in the same breath. This confused Koretsky as much as it would confuse anyone, and he expressed surprise that it was the anti-Gamergate side that would respond to a private email with a public accusation of harassment. The next bit of news is that Koretsky created spjairplay.com and announced which speakers were being invited to speak on behalf of the Consumer Revolt. The invited speakers are... Milo Yiannopoulos, columnist for the conservative news and opinion outlet Breitbart. Brad Wardell, a game developer and president and CEO of Stardock, who had his reputation damaged by slanderous articles in the games press. Kathy Young, a journalist and author who contributes regularly to Reason Magazine, and who's written about Gamergate and was present at the GG in DC meetup. Christina Hoff Summers, freedom feminist and author, scholar with the American Enterprise Institute, who's been involved in Gamergate since the early days when she put out videos on the topic. Oliver Campbell, a vocal and well-spoken proponent of Gamergate, an author and an ex-games journalist. Mark Seb, creator of the Action Points video channel on YouTube, where he analyzes games in the gaming industry, and he's been following the Gamergate controversy in Consumer Revolt. He's put out some very well-spoken and earnest videos on it. William Usher, a games journalist who's passionate about journalistic ethics, and who helped blow the lid off the Game Journal Pros list. Jennifer Daw, a game developer who has supported and has been supported by the Consumer Revolt since the early days. I have my own opinion on this list, and everyone has their own opinions as well, so I'm not going to try to change anyone's opinion or anything like that. Basically, this list is fine in my view. I mean, sure, if I were to make my own list, it would probably be a bit different, but I see nothing wrong with this one. I'll finish up the section on airplay with the unsurprising revelation that no speakers for the other side have been announced yet. Koretsky has offered them the shield of anonymity, so we might not know who they are until the day of the event. I just wanted to dip my paw back into the waters of Kickstarter again to point out that yet another possible conflict of interest was found recently. Polygon face and news editor for Polygon, Brian Crescente, was found to have been a naughty boy. He donated to the Kickstarter campaign for Wasteland 2 and then wrote a rather flattering article about it. Hmm, this seems to have been a habit at Polygon for a while now. Something to keep your eyes on going forward. Again, a shout out to A Plant for the articles tying journalists to Kickstarters. And thanks to Boogie Pop Robin for the digging. Financial conflicts of interest come in many shapes and sizes, but the one that looks the most messy is when a developer or publisher pays a journalist, and then that journalist goes on to write about their games. We've already called out Chris Priestman for doing this once, while well, Digs in the last two weeks turned up two more instances of it, thanks to Boogie Pop Robin and a plant. So Chris Priestman writes for Kill Screen Daily, and he also has a Patreon. First of all, Augustin Cord pays money into that Patreon. 
And he's been doing that since before Priestman decided to write an article on Kord's Lovecraft-themed game, no disclosure in sight that the developer was paying him. Who else is paying Priestman? Well, Only Slightly is. Only Slightly is a one-person studio who makes some rather interesting games. How interesting? Well, you can't make this shit up. Here's an article by Priestman entitled, Happy Valentine's Day! Here's a game where you make out with a bear. It's a pay-what-you-want romantic tongue-based dueling game called The Lickening, and it was shilled by Priestman shortly after only slightly subscribed to his Patreon. Now, it's not clear if any payments had gone through in the short gap between when the article was written and when the Patreon subscription happened, but the Patreon subscription happened before the article came out, so it is a financial relationship with a potential conflict of interest. So, Kill Screen Daily? How about an ethics policy? Or a Patreon policy? I couldn't find either of these things on your site. I found your mission statement, and if you guys really think that games are serious business, you need to start treating them seriously by stepping up to the plate and instituting some serious ethics policies. A couple of small headlines. First of all, a two-part interview with veteran game developer Dennis Dyack was released on Niche Gamer. In the first part, he details, among other things, how he was the victim of yellow journalism at the hands of Kotaku. In the second part, he goes into more depth about his opinion on Gamergate. I'm not gonna spoil it, I'm gonna make you click those Niche Gamer links in the description. Give them some love as we rebuild. The other big headline is that Gamergate will be getting a hearing in front of the Dutch Media Ethics Council. Basically, back in October of 2014, a Dutch broadcasting news program ran a horribly inaccurate hit piece on the Consumer of Vault, and complaints about this to the Dutch Press Council resulted in a hearing on the matter, which will be held on June 26th. The full details are available in a William Usher piece that I'm putting in the description. So, I'm not used to being put in a position where I have to defend myself personally against the gaming press, but I feel like I need to talk about Brendan Keough and the Digra2015 hashtag. He's a PhD candidate and a video game critic in outlets such as Overland, Reverse Shot, Unwinnable, and Paste. He was also an attendee at the Digra2015 conference, and currently has three points on Deep Freeze for alleged potential corruption and cronyism. He's the one that called Deep Freeze a hit list and urged people not to share links to it, so I put a link to his entry in the description. Check it out. Now, what happened in the hashtag for the Digra 2015 conference is going to be subjective point of view due to the way Twitter works, so let me describe my experiences and then we can go into Brendan's characterization of the same events. So, the Digra 2015 conference was held from May 14th to May 17th, and it used the Digra 2015 hashtag. Sometime on May 16th, I saw the hashtag pop up in my feed. I don't recall what caused it to show up there. I clicked it and I browsed around, and it was mostly just stuff for people in attendance. There were a couple of tweets from Consumer Revolt participants, but they were few and far between, and the accounts that they were coming from were predictable, and it was nothing disruptive. And then I spotted this tweet. That got me slightly upset. Promoting the GG Autoblocker to an industry event? That fits the definition of promoting an industry blacklist to me. And I said as much, on Twitter in the Digra2015 hashtag. And on Kotaku in action as well, where it hit the front page. Yay, meaningless internet points. <laughs> Well, there we go, yet another thing to fill out Brendan's deep freeze entry. What I did not realize is that in the process, I bought a whole bunch of attention to the Digra2015 hashtag. My tweet got a metric ass ton of faves and retweets, escalating it to the tippy top of both the Digra2015 and the Gamergate hashtags, causing two very different cultures to clash with each other. Now, Brendan wrote a post-mortem of this occurrence, and in it, he referred to me repeatedly without using my nickname. Gee, thanks, Brendan, for giving me a chance to defend myself. I'm most interested in part four, where he accuses me of engaging in revisionist history. In it, he first states that he first recommended the GG Autoblocker a week before the conference. This is correct, and I found this tweet on May 11th. Then he states that he started seeing some, quote, Gator accounts popping up and made the suggestion again. This is also correct. There were a, a small number of what could be considered Gator accounts posting in the tag before his suggestion. Very small. I've archived the search results for every day of the conference, and I found two tweets on the 15th from Consumer Revolt participants, and five tweets from three accounts on the 16th before Brendan made his suggestion. If this was spamming, we're the world's shittiest spammers. Of course, if Brendan has better data than we do, he's free to share it. I have archives of each day, which are in the description. 
Now back to his article. This is the good part, because this is where he accuses me of revisionist history, because I had the audacity to blame this on him by saying that he was aggravating the participants of the Consumer Revolt. He says that because he never used the hashtag or said anything to a Revolt member that he was not provoking us. Pro tip Brendan, Gamergate is the new normal. You are a member of the games press, so your online behavior will forevermore be under constant scrutiny. When you make jokes about Gamergate, like tagging DARPA 2015 when posting a slide with triangles on it, it's gonna get noticed. When you reference the GG autoblocker and promote it as an industry blacklist, it's gonna make gamers make the consumers angry. That is an act of provocation. So whether you like to admit it or not, you hold a nice big chunk of the responsibility for the invasion of the hashtag. Need more proof? Go look at the archives following the GG autoblocker post. What are the gamers angry about? They're angry about the promotion of the GG autoblocker. That's their primary concern. So before you go accusing me of revisionist history, without giving me a chance to reply, mind you, perhaps it would be best to actually go look at what the facts are. Brendan, I'm going to give you a courtesy that you did not afford me. I will tag you when this video is posted so you can reply if you want. And if you would be so kind as to not try and conceal your reply from me this time, it would be greatly appreciated. Thanks. And by the way, if you want to see what a real planned invasion of a hashtag looks like, look at what happened to the Games Press hashtag last week. And we're out of time again, but this has been fun, so thanks for joining us again. Remember to subscribe and retweet if you enjoyed yourself. See you again next time. Ciao!